prediction. Let's bring in Ryan O'Hanlon. Read a great, great article. You can check it out on ESPN.com. Getting into the Saudi Pro League and obviously their inflection of, of billion dollars into what that's done to the market, what's done to global football. Ryan, thanks for joining us. I guess we just kind of start there. As, as you've kind of – your piece is great, and you go through so many different layers of it. And of course, money is so such an undergirding of all this conversation. But this just kind of as, – as you've kind of had this post-mortem, now we've seen this full, 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 first full summer and transfer window and all this change. What was your kind of biggest takeaway as far as where we're at and where they're – what the Saudi Pro League has done and what they're going potentially to do to what world football? Yeah, I wanted to quickly uh, nominate Al Itihad and Al Halal as a, as a derby, uh, <laughs> one of the world's best derbies. But uh-huh. n- no, so, you know, this summer was sort of a, it was like an experiment, right? What happens when a billion dollars is essentially dropped onto European soccer? Because uh, Saudi Pro League teams basically spent around a million dollars um, on transfer fees this year. That money, it's like a, over a 1,000% increase on what they spent last year. Um, and pretty much all that money money went directly to European clubs. And I think from a competitive perspective so far, it's mirrored live golf in a lot of ways where it's guys that are kind of over the hill, guys that can still win games now, but guys that aren't going to get better um, and are probably going to probably going to get worse. So from that perspective, I don't think, you know, we didn't see any major teams really lose key pieces that I think were going to affect their prospects this season. But I feel like there was sort of like a knock-on effect of there's an extra billion dollars in European soccer. And to me, this transfer window, I found myself more often than I had over the past couple of years, kind of shaking my head at the transfers that were happening. So to me, it was kind of like, uh, you know, you find 20 bucks on the street, you're not going to throw it into an index fund. You're probably going to go spend it right away. So I think to me, it encouraged European teams to be a little bit reckless with their spending this summer. Stevie, what do you make of it when you look at it in terms of the movement of players out of the, out of particularly out of the Premier League and then into the Premier League from some of the bigger clubs in terms of what they're willing to spend on some of these guys and what this means going forward? Like, what do you kind of make of, of what you saw in the summer and what you think we're going to see going forward? Well, I think as far as the money that came into the, to the European game, it was fantastic. Um, you know, the fact that Salah didn't go, I, I agree 100%. It, it's players who weren't going to be better, uh, weren't going to make the, their own team better, probably. Um, and it was a lot of guys that, that not really that many top, certainly top clubs wanted. So I think I think the first reaction for me is that it was such a great summer for moves. Every single day there was something happening. And, and I think most teams probably look at what they've done and think that they've made themselves better. And until the game's... Uh, certainly until we're, we're into a chunk of games, you, you won't know whether that's true or not, but it kind of feels like that. I feel as though teams have, have managed to revamp them. A lot of teams have managed to revamp themselves because of the money that they've been uh, given from, from the Saudis. And so right now, I don't see it have been any harm at all. I still don't see... I don't see somebody like Osman, for example, going to Saudi now or going in the winter or going next summer I don't see that. I think I think football players want to be where the big the big trophies are, uh, where the prestige is. Um, I mean, there's no prestige in Saudi Arabia. You know, let's let's be honest. We play because yes, we want to do well financially, but we play because we want to win trophies. We want to win the Champions League. We want to win the big domestic leagues. And I don't think that's changed yet. Uh, I certainly don't believe it will for younger players. And so I don't believe that. I think in four and five years' time, the guys that are going to be going there are going to be the same sort of guys that went this year. Uh, I honestly believe that. Yeah, awesome. And at 24, I think, or even obviously we read about Mbappe, the billion-dollar offer for a similar guy in a similar age frame. That would be different if those guys were going. Augie, when you talk to clubs, do they feel the same way? This is almost like it's kind of a bank, and you can offload a lot of players. I mean, Chelsea did a lot. You can offload a lot of guys that, that nobody else would have bought in years past, and you're getting a good price back for them. Um, do the clubs view this the same way? Or there, is there a concern that there may be a tipping point where you start to actually have younger players, players in their prime, choosing to go play there versus playing for the highest trophies? Yeah, I think, I think right now the club see it as an opportunity to, to cash in, basically, and get high-earning players off the wage bill. And that, that's happened. So it's, re- it's worked for Saudi. They've got the players they want, but it's also worked for the European leagues. And I think, I think the guys are right in the sense that, you know, Mbappe just ran a mile from the opportunity to go to Saudi Arabia. He wasn't interested. And I think... 
if you get to a point, well, let, let's say Man United or Chelsea, you know, so big clubs that are not not winning clubs right now. If they went for a player next next summer, let's say they went for you know Gonzalo Ramos or something like that, and he chose to go to Saudi Arabia instead, then that would be that would be a bit of a wake up call because if, if Saudi Arabian teams are beating the likes of Man United and Chelsea to players, then that would be a bit of a game changer. But what Saudi have done right now, they've put themselves on a, on a level of, of of being able to compete for players. But what is the next step? Can they get the players that are in the mid twenties that might be interesting other big clubs, or are they just going to hoover up more? You know, thirty somethings next summer. You know, Salah's interesting because, like Stevie says, these big players want to win the big trophies. But Salah's done everything. He's won the Premier League. He's won the Champions League. So you could basically say that, well, having done everything he needs to do, he could move on. But the players that have still got that ambition and that drive, I don't see any of those. Certainly, the guys in the mid twenties going to Saudi Arabia. And I think, I think for a while yet, it's going to be a league that just attracts the older players and the clubs that and the players that clubs want to get rid of. Yeah, Salah does his deal expires in 25. So we may be reliving the same conversation next summer with one year left on his deal currently. Ryan, real quick before you, before you go, in terms of we've seen this with China in, in years past recently when they were buying players similar to their similar ilk, guys are towards the end of their career kind of over the hill. Um does this have more staying power than China or will this be a similar situation? Will they will they kind of fizzle out or will they maybe stop spending as much in the years to come? Like, where do you see this going? Yeah, I, I guess, guess part of it, uh, you know, it's always fun to have to say this when you're trying to talk about soccer. Some of it maybe depends on the global price of oil <laughs> over the next couple <laughs> of years and how that affects uh, Saudi Arabia's wealth. But I think compared to those other two examples, uh, in terms of soccer spending, Saudi Arabia still has almost unlimited money, basically. So it's sustainable from a financial perspective. But what the end goal is, it's not really clear. I think they want to host the World Cup, but you know, from making it a sustainable competitive league, I think there's the issues of all these players are old and they're going to get worse. So like the league, the players currently in the league aren't going to get better as time goes on. They're all going to probably get injured more often and not be as good. And then you also have this issue of like, there's four teams owned by the PIP, the, the sovereign wealth fund. And that creates a situation where the league itself is not going to be competitive. It's going to have four teams that have unlimited funding behind them fighting for the title, which in and of itself doesn't really create a interesting product, I, I think, for people that would even be curious about watching something like this. So I think the spending will continue. I'm not uh, bullish on it as a viable product that will like become a league that people want to watch anytime soon, though. Gotcha. Thanks a lot, Ryan. Appreciate it. And again, you can check out his piece on ESPN.com. It's great. Thanks, Ryan. Appreciate your time. Well, thank you very much for watching ESPN on YouTube. For more sports highlights and analysis, be sure to download the ESPN app. And for live streaming, premium content, and let's not forget as well, ESPN FC, seven days a week. Subscribe to ESPN+. Plus.